Tonight we'll be concluding the fifth chapter of Ephesians. This will be our 71st lesson. <coughs> I wanted to just say a brief word about our prayer gatherings. We've experienced some uh, good progress in this area. And I'd like you to join me, join me in purging from our presence any remnants of powerless prayer meetings. I mean, I've really had my fill of them. I don't want any more of them. Amen. I lived the better part of my life where prayer was wasted in the church. It really didn't amount to a hill of beans and everybody knew it didn't, but nobody was quite willing to talk about it. <laughs> but the early churches noted that when they prayed, something happened. Yeah. And there's been now long centuries of time where this has not happened. It's not been because God has changed or anything like that. Yeah. So we will uh, adopt his agenda and live by faith. We have every reason to be optimistic about what kind of results can happen. Okay, there's no such thing as a prayer request that's too hard. See, sometimes we receive requests and if you listen to your flesh, it's... But we, we, we can be delivered from that and God can raise us up as an ensign in a light, yes. people can see mm -hmm. a demonstration of this and be able to say that a notable work has been done. We cannot deny. That's, that's what we want to, to target. And as I say, we've been making, we're, we're moving in that direction, and this is a wonderful thing. Now, men have this uh, inveterate tendency to defer to the flesh making it their emphasis. It's uh, something you fight against all your life. It's uh, the, another law in your members. And Paul knows this. See, when you minister, you got to know these weaknesses that people have of the flesh. Not, not moral weakness. We're not talking about moral weakness or spiritual weakness. I mean, it's, you've got this flesh is shouting all the time. And if a person is not attentive to God, he'll start listening to the <laughs> to the flesh. It may even think he's listening to God. But Paul knows this tendency. So he's going to labor now to tell us that in this fifth chapter he's not been really talking about marriage convention. Right. You've got to say that, see, because there's still some folk have never got that message. Yeah. Uh -huh. When they read Ephesians 5, and this is they don't go they don't go far enough. Paul starts with Mary, but boy, he doesn't end there at all. Amen. And as we said, the, the relationship between Christ and the church is so unique, there really is nothing precisely like it in the world. The closest thing to it is marriage, and that's by divine intent. Yeah, right. It isn't that God looked at marriage and said, well, there we have some likeness. He, he made marriage for this purpose. This is why marriage was instituted. If it wasn't for Christ and the church, there never would have been, there'd been repopulation by some other means. But it's because of Christ and the church. So God hasn't patterned heavenly things after earthly things. He's, he's created earthly things in view of heavenly things. God is... Uh, wants heavenly things to be understood. A God that is not understood cannot advantage, shall I say, cannot consciously advantage people because they don't have the capacity to know that was the Lord. See, they don't, they don't know God enough well enough to recognize that. So Paul is teaching with this in mind that God wants to be understood. Man has uh, 
Well, great difficulty really staying at two weeks. Man of himself or by nature cannot comprehend something that's outside the circumference of human experience. It's just the way it is. God made man that way. So when he talks about things that are external to human experience, they're like up here. And the only way that can change is for God to open the thing up. But he's got to have some kind of a common denominator to work with. And so he's created certain things upon earth, husband and wife. <laughs> you may not agree with this, but that doesn't make any difference. Master, slave. <clears throat> That's a non-purpose. That's a non-purpose arrangement. So as you know, there is such a thing as you not being your own and being bought with a price and doing what someone else wants. I know you can cite civil rights and all kind of stuff like that, but the fact of the matter is that God instituted that. Then he put, he put boundaries around it, the master to treat the slave right and slave to obey the master right. He built boundaries around it. But that relationship shows you an aspect of God's association with, association with his people that would be very hard to understand otherwise. Marriage is the same way. And children to parents, as we're going to find later, is the same way also. Now, before Paul ever brought up this thing about domestic responsibilities, he first laid the foundation and told us what God had done because we've got to be able to connect this with what, he's, what he said previously. He said, now God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Yeah. That's before he ever got into any kind of what we're supposed to do. He said he predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ before he ever taught, told us anything we're to do before he ever got into that he grounded the people with this so when you think about yourself and God he did everything Amen. he said now we have redemption through Christ's blood even the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace it's just to let you know why you got this and he's abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Now, you wouldn't get the idea from the average church that God has abounded. I mean, if you view the modern church, you think in terms of teaspoons, not truckloads. I mean, everybody knows. I'm not saying anything that everybody with one eye and a half sense doesn't know. You just don't think of a lot of things coming from God when you, well, let's, instead of saying the modern church, think, let's, uh, when we think of our past. Let's just, let's just confine it to our past. That's not how we thought. We thought in terms of a little here and a little there. Maybe. And he's made known to us the mystery of his will. That is what he, what God has purposed to do he finally, after 4,000 years, has told men about it. He didn't tell them about it for the first 4,000 years. He hid his purpose because it was too high. Yeah. It's too high. He had to take the, he had to school some special people on the earth so they'd be able to understand at least a modicum of what he's purposed to do. And in all of this, God has remained tender. He's noted for love. <laughs> In all of this, and other men have made a cold doctrines out of some of these things. About election, predestination, choosing us in Christ. They made a cold, calculating doctrine out of them. See, God is love. And he is merciful. And he is full of grace, and this permeates all that he does. So now he's, that's the thing that's being drawn out in this uh, marriage relationship. See, love, tenderness, care. These are, these are divine qualities. 
This isn't something their husbands are. They're to be this. God is this. Yeah. Well, that in mind, he continues talking to the husbands. Verses uh, 28 to 33. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. Uh, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now that's a piece of wise teaching. Nothing's left out, but it's ordered. There are certain priorities. And the, pri the thing that has the priority gives power to the thing that's under it. So the superior relationship is Christ and the church, and if you see it, it empowers this other relationship. So, so the higher one can be seen in the lower one. Amen. <clears throat> so ought men. I just like that. I just like the way it said. Go ahead, Brother Bob. It occurred to me while you were giving the introduction there that when men skip the the what God has taught in the first in the, in the, what we call it the old covenant, when men skip that and they revert to a lexicon, they say, "Okay, we're going to see God is love. We're going to look this up." What they end up with is a hollow understanding That's right. of God. That's they don't. Right. Have, it doesn't have the body. It doesn't have That's the fullness. Right. If you see God in in real life and what He's laid out for us to learn what He's like, yeah. then you 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 it's impossible for you to form a right understanding or view of God. Amen. Amen. So ought now you'll never in this life get beyond ought. You you, you can't you can't get so close to God that the ought goes away. The ought is for people in the flesh. Yes. I don't mean in the sinful flesh, I mean in the body of flesh. The ought, man. Some other versions say ought also. So he's point, he's, the ought is pointing to something else that happened. Or in the same way, or even so, or this is how. So what exactly is the parallel that he's making? So, or, or what What's directing our thinking on this subject? Well, it's this. That Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it and present it to himself, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. So, in that manner, that's the... The pattern's not a commandment. The pattern is an example. Well, there's a lot of difference. There's a lot of difference there now. There's a lot of difference. Now, you can't get beyond commandments either. You can't live so close to God that there are no commandments. But the commandments can't be your main incentive. Now, what was required for the Lord Jesus to uh, love the church and give himself for it? I and mean, what was required of doing that? Well... <clears throat> He had to humble himself. That was involved in this. Now he's gonna. That's just if he's gonna love the church. He has to humble himself. He has to step down, so to speak. He had to. Second Corinthians eight nine says he had to become poor. He had to deprive himself of. He had to get out of reach of the, of his of divine. Prerogatives. He had to get in a position where he depended on God too. See? Now this is what he had to do to love the church. Give himself for it. He had to lay down his life. And take it up again. 
He had laid down his life for the sheep. I laid down my life for the sheep. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> now, I'm sorry. He didn't say he laid down his life for the world. I did, I'm sorry. It's, not, it's just not what it says. Amen. There's a sense in which he did. I understand this, but he laid down his life for the sheep. Because the husband just can't be kind to his wife because he's kind to everybody. Yeah, that's right. He says a special kind of kindness that, frankly, nobody else gets. He's teaching us about Christ in the church, but you've got to get, get it straight what, what he's using to do it. And Jesus did this because he was doing the Father's will, not my will be to... So this is how the husband loves his wife. He's not thinking of himself. He's thinking of what God, what God wants. <laughs> now then he gives the first pronouncement of Adam concerning husband and wife, and it was like a, it was like a prophecy concerning Christ in the church. And therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And this is just the opposite of the way normally this is considered. Normally the wife leaves and joins to the husband. That's how it's presented. And she does do this. Ah, but that's not what he says here. I mean, maybe you thought of having your son live in your house with his wife, were you? Well, no, your son's got to leave you when he gets married. Sorry. For this cause, the man makes the move. How about that? Why? Well, because this is what Jesus, see, the real thing he's talking about isn't the marriage. That's not what he's really talking about. What he's talking about is Christ in the church, and Christ left something to get a bride. Wasn't thinking of himself. That's a transcendent love. See that? There's nothing in the world that really can open that up to you. But if you want to understand Christ, you've got to see this. This is the kind of love Paul states that it involves a husband loving their wives as their own bodies. He's talking about this body right here. Is their own bodies. And he adds, no man ever yet hated his own flesh. I mean, I know there are people that abuse themselves, but they've, they're they not the norm. They're, the, they're the, uh, the exception. They're the, pardon the phrase, fruitcakes. They're the ones that, this isn't the way it normally is at all. Man loves his flesh, takes care of his flesh. Now, I... You probably heard people say, well, you can't love others till you love yourself. Yeah. I don't know where that got started, but that, that's kind of growing. Yeah. How do you know you love yourself? He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Yeah. <laughs> how's, yeah. how's that for reasoning? Yeah. You would think he's a he that loves himself loves his wife. That's not what he says. It's he that loves his wife loves himself. How about that? Of course, they've been joined together as one flesh, you understand. That to me is a very, uh, <laughs> that's like saying, by this we know we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. That's what John said. You proceed from the higher to the lower. No man ever yet hated his own flesh, so he's within the bounds of nature. God made man, so he eats when he's hungry, he puts on clothes when he's cold, he drinks when he's thirsty, he hides when it's danger, he thinks about himself. That's the way God made him, see? Amen. This this isn't the way he evolved. This is the way God made him. So he thinks about himself. You don't have to go to school to learn that you have to eat. Whenever you get a hunger pang, you eat something. When you're thirsty, you drink something. You don't have to take a class on that. That's built in the human nature. So he says, love your wife as you love your own bodies. Love your own bodies as they're taken for granted. In other words, you don't eat when you're hungry, but you let your wife starve when she's hungry. <laughs> yeah. You don't make sure you got proper clothing, but your wife doesn't. You don't set the water bucket outside your door and not let your wife have access to it. He teaches us something now about Christ in the church. 
No man ever yet hated his own flesh, but he nourisheth and cherisheth it as he feeds it and takes care of it. This is just the way man is. All people pray. They'll pray, give me this day my daily bread. They'll pray this because this is built into their character. Now in the case of a married man, we are no more twain or two, but one flesh. So that's, it isn't that the man studies himself and says, oh, this is the way I love myself. Let's see, well, that's the way I should love my wife. It isn't, we are one flesh, so that when he thinks of himself, he automatically is thinking, he's thinking of his wife. Or that's just in the thought process. They're one flesh. They're, they're not different. He doesn't think of his wife as something under his feet. Thinks of something by his side. An appropriate uh, help meet. Yeah. That's one word. That's, that's a, a mate that can help. Join in the work, so to speak, the system. The only acceptable thing for a husband to do is to nourish and, cher nourish and cherish his wife. Make sure she's taken care of, make sure she has proper resources, because, he says, even as the Lord the church, so there he gets back to what he's really talking about, Jesus nourishes and cherishes the church. Now listen, brethren, sisters, if the church isn't being nourished, it's not because Jesus has quit nourishing. If the church isn't being properly cared for, it's not because Jesus has quit caring. It's because there's some imposters. Yes. Amen. I'm going to be merciless here. It's because there's some imposters heading up the church. It's because these men are not in link with Christ. Christ doesn't live in them. Christ doesn't work through them. However nice they may be, however nice they may be, if the church is not being nourished and cherished, the guy at the head has got to be kicked out. Yeah. Yeah. He's unworthy of the position. Mm -hmm. And if they won't do that, the people ought to get up and leave. Right. Let them have to go to work at Walmart or something. I'm serious when I say this, because this is what Jesus does to the church. If you find a church that's not known to nourish, something's wrong, because this is what Jesus does. He cherishes and nourishes, he feeds and cares for the church so that it's not deficient in what it knows and it's not deficient in what it has. That's what the true shepherds do. They follow Christ. Now at this point, <coughs> the care of Jesus for the church is largely unknown. Not many people talk about this. The care Jesus has for the church. How he loves and nourishes the church. Some, this is largely because some people have misinterpreted something Jesus said. I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so they think there are some people that are righteous that God didn't come for. <laughs> <laughs> what he was saying is there isn't anybody that's righteous yeah, that's right. the Pharisees thought they were righteous yeah, yeah. there isn't anybody Jesus didn't come to save Amen. nobody everybody was unrighteous you see people misinterpreted that so they neglect the church because they teach that God prefers us to speak to sinners no when he established a mediator it wasn't for sinners. When he established an intercessor, it wasn't for sinners. It was for saints. He loves and cares for the church. This is what he does. I know people say, what about that sheep? What about that sheep? They forget the sheep was in the fold. The sheep wandered away from the fold. It wasn't a wild sheep out there. It was a wandering sheep. And he brought it back to the fold. 
Jesus loves, and that's part of the loving and caring for the church. I know this because I was one of those he went out and got. That wandered away. Yeah. Hmm. Some of you were too. Amen. That what was it? That was nourishing and cherishing the church. Amen. Jesus does this. Now the manner in which he nourishes and cherishes the nourishes and cherishes the church now is through the gifts he's placed in it. He itemized, you remember, in the fourth chapter, verse eleven, apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors, teachers. He works through them to feed, nourish, make healthy the church, and to care for it so that it's not unduly wounded or doesn't get sick, doesn't get infirm. He works through those gifts. He tells them, feed my, feed, feed my flock. Feed my sheep. Feed the church of God. Feed the flock of God. Don't neglect. I mean, this is plain enough. He's said enough about this. Everybody ought to know. Now, husbands, that's how you to love your wife. Like that. Yes, amen. What's a different, kind of a different, he's not talking about any emotion. Mm -hmm. That's right. He's not talking about an emotion yeah. or an affection. Or oh, you'll have that, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a function, something yeah. that, uh -huh. that works. And I think it just would mean a lot to a lot of wives if their husbands did this. This would mean... This would probably resolve a lot of trouble <laughs> if they did this. Now immediately he's brought up Christ to the church. Now, he, he now he's going to focus on that. He's not going to linger very long on this other subject of the husbands and the wives. He's going to develop now this thought. Christ nourishes and cher cherishes and nourishes the church. He's getting to the heart of the teaching now, see. He knows that the thing comprehended, to be comprehended, is not the relationship of husbands and wives. Or shall I, let me restate that the, the fundamental thing to be noted is not that. That will assist us in seeing the sensitivity that exists between Christ and his church. It's a very real relationship. I don't like that word relationship. I just can't think of another one appropriate. But there's, there's a two-sided. It's a two-sided thing. Mm -hmm. That's right. Jesus cherishes, cher nourishes, and cherishes the church, and the church is thankful and productive yeah. as a result. And it's a. Amen. It's very tender. Reciprocity. Reciprocity. Very yeah. tender, like a husband and a wife. Yeah. It's a tender. Relationship. It's not a thing. Well, well, 20 years ago I got married and we loved each other, and it's been exactly the same. It's a, it's a living. It's a moment by moment. Yeah. And I know in myself, if I neglect any part of that, then things will arise because of the neglect. Like if I don't, if I don't, making the translations, if I don't keep, if I don't keep in fellowship with Christ, even though I was in fellowship, that doesn't do me any good. Uh -huh. It's yeah. got to be yeah. a a, yeah. a moment by moment, a living relationship, Amen. relationship a living fellowship. Amen. I says, uh, for we are members of his body. Some other versions say parts of his body. Now whether we're speaking of individuals or of churches, they are members or parts of Christ's body. The church is Christ's body because it was taken from him like Eve was created from Adam. He took a rib from Adam and the use of the language that referred to that later indicates that some flesh went along with it. It just wasn't like a bone. It's flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. So there's there's some flesh that went along with the bone. There was a... God created a wife from mm -hmm. something that came from Adam. Amen. So this, uh, this kinship of Christ and the church 
is not philosophical. It's not metaphorical. It's not analogical. That is like a type. It's very real. So he adds this. We are of his flesh and of his bones. <clears throat> Most modern versions omit that phrase. That's not in the modern versions at all. Of his flesh and of his bones. It is in the King James, the New King James, the Darby, Douay, Reims, Geneva, Murdoch, Bishop's Bible, Tyndale's Bible, Webster's, Young's Literal Translation, Revised Webster's International Standard Bible, Apostolic Bible, English Majority Text, and Literal Trans Translation of the Bible. I just say that to show that the scholars have not by any means sided with these new translations. We're not the only ones that don't like them. Of his flesh and of his bone. Now this, of course, is in perfect agreement with what Adam said, his response. He said, this is now my, now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. I take that text just as it stands. There was some bone and flesh from Adam that was used as the basis for creating Eve. They two shall be one flesh. Now just as something from Adam was used to create Eve, something from Christ was used to create the church. Amen. That's why they're called one flesh. In the case of Adam, he, God took one of Adam's ribs and some flesh. It's assumed that flesh came with it. In the case of the church, something from Christ is found in her. Now, let's just mention, mention some of them. She has the mind of Christ. It's like a bone. She has the spirit of Christ. She has the savor or sweet smell of Christ. The truth of Christ is in us, the scripture says. The power of Christ is in us. The afflictions of Christ, I'm showing here that we, something from Christ makes us what we are. The afflictions of Christ are in us, the word of Christ dwells in us, the dying of the Lord Jesus is in us, and the life of the Lord Jesus is in us, and we're partakers of Christ. That's what makes us what we are. It's what of Christ is in us that makes us what we are. Amen. It's not what we did that makes us what we are. It's who we have that makes us what we are. Now, it's, it's, it's a fine distinction, but it's got to be made, because there's all kind of people, I know they say, they, they look at their baptism, which is necessary. They look at their baptism as the indication that they're Christ's. Well, technically speaking, that's a secondary evidence. Yeah, exactly. The primary evidence is that Christ's nature is in you. Yeah, yeah. And if it isn't in you, your baptism counts for nothing. Yes. Yeah. Just like Adam and, and Eve. See, just like Adam and Eve. These realities are to us. Mind of Christ, Spirit of Christ, Savior of Christ, Truth of Christ, Power of Christ, Afflictions of Christ, Word of Christ, Dying of Christ, Living of Christ, Partakers of Christ. They are to us what the bone in the flesh was to, of Adam was to Eve. It's what we have from Jesus. It's what we have from Jesus that enables us to be joined to Jesus. See, see? <laughs> it, it, it's kind of, kind of simple. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm ashamed that it sounds so simple, but... That's why we're related to Christ, is because something from Him yes. is in us. Amen. That's what constitutes us the body of Christ. You know, all of this is associated now with Christ nourishing and cherishing the church. Yeah, I never thought about it before that. Now, she's, the, she's a help that's meat for Adam. It's good. She's actually compatible with that. That's compatible. Amen. Because of this thing now. About, I never made the connection that the church is compatible with Christ and that a, he's made her to be that helper that's made that's right. for him. That's right. That's right. Actually, this thing, uh, is, it can be seen that uh, also Christ was a God's helper. That's God, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Start, Amen. Starts yeah. up there and works, yeah. his, Amen. works, works his way right on. Amen. That's exactly right.
Yeah. It's, it's like the word suitable to be suitable. That's good. Mm-hmm. And you know the, the scripture that says that that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Being yoked with Christ. Yeah, uh, that's right. A picture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, suitable will be like an an ass plowing with an ox. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I had some things that weren't suited. They couldn't. It couldn't work together under the law. They couldn't. Uh, yep. Couldn't work together. That's good. Suitable. I like that. Suitable or compatible. See, those are good. Good words to describe this. All of this again is associated with Christ nourishing and cherishing the church. This in turn is made discernible to us. We can kind of we can kind of get an understanding of it by the husband wife relationship. See that puts it. But this relationship wasn't created by man. This relationship was created by God. And so when we look at marriage, we look at it as God intended it, not as it as it appears. Yeah. I've heard people say that are new converts that come from very bad families that I never did know what a father was. And I can appreciate. But you can't understand the father by looking at your father. <laughs> the father, capital F. You can't ex- you can't understand the Father in heaven by looking at your father. So actually, whether people recognize it or not, you could have had the worst father in all the world, and that doesn't handicap you at all in understanding God. Amen. Because God is unique yes, right. in his fatherhood. So this is good to, not to try and teach people to look at your earthly relationship to help you understand the heavenly one. Look at the heavenly one to help you understand the earthly one. It's just it's the opposite father sacrificing his son yeah, that's right. for someone who had violated yeah. the things that he loved and cared about there's hardly that. there's no father no. that would do that mm-hmm. when I wouldn't even lay down his life for his friends yeah. yeah. <laughs> alright now we verse 32 says this is a great mystery <laughs> this is a great mystery mm-hmm. other versions read a profound mm-hmm. mystery well, a great secret. One version says a profound truth is hidden here. The mystery has great significance, which normally you wouldn't think a mystery had significance, see? <laughs> but in Scripture, mystery means something that was concealed but is now revealed. When you read mystery in the apostolic writings, that's what it means. Another version said, this is a great truth hitherto kept secret. This is a huge mystery. I don't pretend to understand it. That's the message. Well, that's way off kilter there. A mystery is something that remains hidden until God reveals it. This is how high God is above man. God can purpose to do something, and unless he tells man what he purposed, there's no way man can come arrive at a knowledge of it. So this is a great mystery. There's a lot in this, in other words. There's a lot in this. Jesus spoke of this kind of union in his parable of the vine and the branches. He spoke of the same mystery under a different under a different likeness. Husband and wife, he the vine and the branches. That teaches integration with the vine. Same truth. The prophets did not delineate this kind of un- this kind of union. They didn't talk about this. They talked about a branch springing up, but they didn't talk about what was on the branch. Even the marriage bond doesn't make this matter clear. You no, know, it's the closest of all bonds because it's it's a bond that yields increase, which is kind of the purpose of the bond with Christ. He sparingly talked about God's people being united with one another. Now I gave you some texts about this. Good and pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity, and they shall all be one, so forth. But the whole matter of being joined unto the Lord was largely omitted from the prophets. Very sparingly if mentioned at all. Such a concept as Acts 5, 4, they were added to the Lord. That is totally absent. 
Pentecostal Moses in the prophets. It's not there. Or being called into fellowship. That's not in The closest you get is the new covenant said they will all know me. But that, that's about as close as you get. See, I meant comment on that was a mystery. Even the prophets, they didn't, they didn't understand this. Christ being in you. <laughs> it was... Prophets didn't talk about this now. Yeah. They didn't talk about this. It was Paul that said, I will walk in them and dwell in them. That was Paul that said that. It wasn't because the prophets were deficient themselves. It's because it couldn't be unveiled during at that time. It, it, it yeah. just couldn't be unveiled because sin had not been taken away yet. The closest relationship with God might have been like walking with God, like, like Enoch and Noah walked with God. That was a pretty close. And God talked to Moses. All right, that gives you a little hint. But being one spirit, you won't find that. Yeah. Now that Moses the prophet, partaking of the divine nature, mm -hmm. it's a mystery. See, it's a great mystery. Mm -hmm. All the revelation given, that wasn't uh, yeah. being made partakers of Christ. On uh, Jeremiah's prophecy, the new covenant, he said God had put his law in the inward parts and write it in their hearts, but he didn't say anything directly about the people being joined to him or him dwelling in them. Yeah. So if this is what we want to know about these things, you've got to get into the sayings of Jesus and the apostles. Yeah, yeah. They start back there. Mm -hmm. See, the, the ministry of Moses and the prophets is necessary, mm -hmm. but you do have to go further. Amen. You can't just plow around in there all the time. You have to have something, it's got to be opened up to you. Amen. And even then, the thing we're talking about now wasn't in, even in typology. It, yes, wasn't, right. it wasn't back there. I speak concerning Christ and the church. That's really what all this teaching is about. Uh -huh. Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms did not speak of Christ and his church as they have now been revealed. They spoke of Christ. They spoke of a change that would take place in the people. They did speak about that. But the associations of Christ and his church were largely a mystery. Just as Paul indicated here. And Paul is the only one that really developed it among the apostles. So if any person wants the details about Christ and the church, they're going to have to subject themselves to the words of Christ and the apostles' doctrine. And after they've heard and received them, they'll see hints of it back in Moses and the prophets. They'll be able to see then some things they didn't see before. But they will not be actually expounded. Now here's what the prophets, Moses and the prophets did. They did declare like a change was going to take place. Like Moses said God would circumcise your hearts. All right, that was fundamental change. Isaiah said the eyes would see, the ears would hear, the heart would be changed. He said again, the eyes of the blind would be open, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the lame would leap, and the dumb would sing. See, there's a change going to take place. Jeremiah said God would give them a heart to know him. He gave them a new heart, a new spirit, remove the stony heart, give them a heart of flesh. But they didn't say anything about that change of nature involving being joined together with the Redeemer and the redeemed. <laughs> they didn't talk about that. That's why it's such a great thing that Paul received this revelation of this mystery. What Paul has expounded to the Ephesians is simply was not known before Christ's atonement. Just wasn't known. So he was at, seated at the right hand of God. It was a mystery concealed prior to that. Now by the grace of God it's a mystery revealed. Because now is the time to do it. He couldn't do this until Jesus was sitting at his right hand, having cast down all opposition and taken away sin and so forth. Now that he's seated, now we can open this up, son. Now we can open this up yeah. to the church, what's involved here. We're talking about man and God being joined yes. together and being one spirit, yes. one in which Jesus is the preeminent party 
but he cherished, nourishes and cherishes the church even though he's superior to the church. See, that's not an earthly concept. This is not an earthly concept. There are earthly dignitaries that are kind, but see, this is, this is not the rule. But this is the standard in, in God's kingdom. Christ takes care of his prospective bride. Amen. Oh, he does. If you just get into the flow of where Jesus ministered, you'll experience what you have. I mean, I've seen it in you. You've experienced it. You're experiencing the, nourish, the, the nourishment and the cherishing of Jesus because you're involved in this work and how tender he is so that you don't fall apart. It's all just marvelous. Well, having said that, she says, nevertheless, I know some people are going to say, well, that doesn't make any difference about husbands and wives. And no, I said, <laughs> the superior teaching does not abrogate the inferior. The higher, higher truths do not discard the lower truths. They both, they both got to stay together. So nevertheless, let every one of you in particular, as each person, still speaking, he's still speaking to husbands now. Each one of you, love your wife as yourself. Don't give yourself all kind of advantages and leave your wife neglected. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why? Because that isn't what Jesus does. That's, right. That's why if anyone has a right to neglect somebody else, if you just want to get on to rights, Jesus has the right. Yeah. But he does not neglect his bride. Amen. He does not. Do not treat her as a vassal. She's a helper, not a vassal. Yes. Treat her like you treat yourself. Give her all the advantages you give yourself. You say, well, they get out of hand if you do that. Well, does the church get out of hand if Jesus blesses it? Well, I mean, there's some people think like this, you know. The church doesn't get out of hand because it's blessed. Because there's something about a blessing that sanctifies. And let the wife know. Let, let, let her see she reverence her husband. Some persons say respect. Some say fear. Not scared fear. Fear is an honor. It's not a trembling fear. Although some husbands have made their wives tremble. Because husbands have done this, brethren. We've uh, we owned some people, wives like that. Husbands scared and they're so mean. This is the kind of fear like Christ, that the church has for Christ. He's not, not wanting to go against him, but receiving him. He's giving an honor to the hierarchy. Mentioned in 1 Corinthians 11, 3. God, Christ, husband, wife. That's the hierarchy. And none of them are... That Jesus obeyed God, but he wasn't a vassal. And the head of every man is Christ. See, everybody's got a head, except God. Everybody's got a head except God. So if you're a wife, you've got a head, but your husband has a head too. Now we remind everybody of that. Remember your head. Remember who's your head now. Christ is your head. I don't think I speak it out of hand here. Christ will treat you like you treat your wife. Boy, that could explain a lot of things, couldn't it? Now this, if this is thought to be a difficult task, Remember Christ in the church. And that, that'll help you to see it. No, this is not a difficult task because this is the manner of the kingdom of God. God set things up so Jesus has a wife. Now we're betrothed. We're not, we're not actually married yet. But he's already treating us kind. He's already loving us and cherishing us. He's already providing for us, and we're not even married yet. Yeah. We're just betrothed. Can you imagine what it's going to be when we're married? Yeah. Just imagine. Yeah. We're going to be following him wherever he goes. Go ahead, Sister Barb. I've been thinking about that through this meeting, because at the very beginning you made mention of the union 
of the man and his bride is when it becomes fruitful. They, Fruit. they are Sorry. productive after their That's right. And That's I right. was considering this, that we are experiencing the increase of the Lord now. That's right. But as mm -hmm. you may mention, this is the time of nourishing and cherishing that we're receiving from the Lord. So this is just like uh -huh. a first fruits fruit That's right. sense. Uh -huh. And then after this world passes away and we are joined mm -hmm. as the bride of Christ to him, that's when the real productivity and the mm -hmm. real fruit, Amen. the fullness of the fruit, Amen. is going to yeah. be born. Amen. <laughs> yes, sister. I was thinking that same thing. <laughs> but, um, I was thinking how the kingdom is ever increasing, and this yeah. is why. Yeah. And this is why uh, we'll neither marry nor be given in marriage. That's so we right. don't need for that then. And uh, while there's a marriage supper, all these things, and this increases the the product of that of the joining together. That's so that's right. why it's an ever increasing. Amen. Thing. <laughs> Amen. You said that God is unique in His fatherhood. Mm -hmm. Thought of the text where it says Israel is a peculiar people. Mm -hmm. Said so in the sense that God is unique in His fatherhood, we are peculiar. We are unique because mm -hmm. we are His children. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. And about, yeah, these um, <clears throat> these pictures, you know, that God that God has placed in in, in the world of this husband and wife, these relationships, these and, and and like being betrothed to someone, or 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 you're not married yet, but you you, you have affection for them, yeah. but but they're they're they have to be maintained. Yeah. You know, yeah, if, if they're if they're um, you know, the world will say, well, it doesn't make any difference. You don't have to just be a man and a woman to get married. You see how it destroys the image. Yeah. It yeah. destroys the picture. Yeah. And so ultimately, if, if if it's allowed, it'll destroy men's perception of, of what Christ and the church really is. That's right. Because he put it in there mm. for a reason. Mm. And now we don't want we don't want to allow it to be destroyed, if you see what I'm saying. No, and amen. this other thing about God withholding uh, revelation until the people were ready. Yeah. Now, see, this is this is a very wise thing, and at the same time, see now people say, "Well, you can tell anybody God loves you," mm -hmm. but see, he he that's it's too soon. Mm -hmm. It's too soon. It, it it actually does more damage Amen. than it does good. You for your sure first you tell them you're a sinner. Yeah. You know, you, law's got to do its work, and and if it works, if a person knows they're under the condemnation mm -hmm. of, they're gonna have to answer to God and. He, now, if they're repentant, see now if they yeah. now now you got a good piece of information, but that can't happen <laughs> until they're joined to the Lord. That's Amen. right. Amen. Until they're joined to the Lord, no one should be told God loves you so yeah. much because yeah. you can't even prove it until they're joined to the Lord. That's now, right. once they're joined to the Lord, now you can show them all this stuff. That's right. And they'll conclude God just loved me. <laughs> see, when you talk about the love of God. It must not be spoken of philosophically. The love of God means nothing if it's not experienced. Yeah. It means nothing to the individual uh -huh. if it's not experienced. So it's the, the experience of God's love is the point of Scripture. Yes, yeah, that's right. And you couldn't experience it if he didn't give it. Yes, amen. Yeah. Right. Yes, Brother, Brother Paul. Yeah, that's one of the issues we said. Uh, the mystery of most of the prophets have a, have a purpose, but we must move on. Then Hebrews 6 1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles, yeah, uh -huh. Christ, uh -huh. go on to unto perfection. That's there's right. That, there's that hierarchy still. <laughs> mm -hmm. Remember the prophets, they wanted to know what or what manner of time. They, want, they were so intense on wanting to understand more yeah. about the coming Savior, but the Lord said, No, this is not for you. Yeah. It's enough that you know, you announce that it's coming, but. Mm -hmm. I can't divulge it yet. Yeah. They could because they couldn't have borne it. See, uh -huh. that's, a, that's a pretty good picture if you can get it. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the woman has the same nature as the man. Make, right. that, make sure that he that's, used that's right. the bone and the flesh. That's right. Her. That's right. And, uh, good. and so we have the same. We have the mm -hmm. same things happen. Mm -hmm. Of course, now God did that. You know, so Amen. that He could teach the spiritual truth. Uh -huh. I was I really was blessed to this consideration of something we were made up from something from Christ. Yes. Amen. And something Amen. from Christ yes. is in us. This uh, you might Amen. like to explore that because a lot there's yes. a lot there, brother Matt, sister Maddie. Looking at the bride gives an indication of the greatness of the groom as well. Over it's been many years now that the Lord has been adding to the church, <laughs> right. one member after another, 
So for for the bride to be made up of a great host of men that have been saved, what yeah. must how great must the groom be Amen. if the bride and the groom are fit uh, for one another? That's yeah. good. That's Jeremy. Yeah, I was thinking about the same thing, really, given about we that was the first time I ever really thought of it. I've heard about that. He took the bone and the flesh, so it's like a piece of him. And like, if you look at a husband and wife, they're not we're not the same, but we look you know we do, we do look the same. And uh, I, I was just reminded about where God says, "Let us make man in our in our image." It's like yeah. God was showing us how He's He's taken us. We're like a part of Him. And we're in in His image, so we 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 are like God. And then you know that same verse, um, Genesis one twenty six, it talks about um, giving Him dominion. That's how God is overall. And and then later on there, in our uh, uh, Romans eight, it's eight seventeen, where it talks about um, we're going to be heirs and joint heirs with Christ yeah. together. And this is I was just thinking about this when you're talking about this marriage, how. The man and woman worked, you know, side by side. It's not like the man is like over the woman, yeah. but working side by side. That we're going to be working side by side with Christ in glory for eternity. You think in, in creation of humanity, something from God, something from Earth was taken, something from God was taken, something from Adam was taken. Yeah. Yeah. Brother Lorraine, you had something. Yeah, this, this picture of, of, of Adam and Eve, where where a part of him was was taken, and then when she was made, then then he was they were brought back together. Yeah. And I thought about the scripture that says that, that we are his workmanship, yeah. created in Christ Jesus yeah. unto good works, which yet the forward in we should walk. Amen. In. You know, our good works are unto him. So it's in like him. we're taken, we're worked with, and then we're brought right back. Brought into back. Christ. That's right. And he was glad to receive us. Here in Romans 15, I believe it is. It says Christ received us. To the glory of God. Yeah. So he drew us to Christ and Christ liked what he saw. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll have a word of prayer.